like my mantra was always relentless attack. Mm -hmm. And so before matches, if my mind started wandering, I would just, in my head, I was just constantly relentless attack, relentless attack, relentless attack. Let's just start with this, man. You guys opened the season 2-0. and I was coming up in January. How are we feeling about the season? Yeah, I mean, I think we started out really well. Obviously, it's the you know first weekend, so I think some of our guys, you know, a little jitters, first Big Ten competition, but I think you know, we started off good on Friday night against Rutgers. And I think the guys wrestled even better on Sunday. They were really embracing that getting the extra bonus points, which is, you know, right now that's what's going to, that's what's going to take to win an NCAA team title uh, is getting those bonus points at big 10 and NCAAs. I love that Dylan Ragusin, man. He is, he is awesome. Yeah. He's a monster, man. It's just the way he competes is, you know, second to none. He's not afraid to wrestle anyone. Uh, you know, he, the first day he was in the room, he was, you know, trying to pick out the best partners and you can't get a better <laughs> recruit than a kid like that. That's calling out, you know, juniors and seniors on the team and, and wants to wrestle. Everybody he wants to wrestle me and Josh all the time. He, he's not scared, scared to compete at all. Dude, those Izzy style guys come with a chip on their shoulder. You look at real woods in him. I, I, I think he was an Izzy style guy, but man, those guys are just, they come in aggressive, ready to go. Yeah. I mean, we have, we have three Izzy style guys on our team right now. Um, they all went undefeated this weekend. So, so it's awesome. Those guys are, you know, they're brought up the right way. They're not scared to compete. They're looking just to wrestle the best and they always expect to win, you know, which is one of the hardest things to teach is when every time they step foot on the mat, they, they just know they're going to win. They're going to find a way to win. And, and we're really lucky to have those three guys on our team. Man, it's just so fun to see what's going on at Michigan. And I was looking back at your time at Michigan. I didn't realize that uh, during the you know later part of your career, it was a little bit of a downturn and then it was kind of building back up and it's been climaxing to this point ever since, you know, that 2012, 2013 era with the Cliff Keen club. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, we got really lucky when Sean came in uh, my senior year, him and Donnie Fritz off, I think brought a bunch of those senior level guys in. And it was, it was awesome for me because, you know, workout partners were a little thin. Then Josh was, was around once in a while, but he was also going down to overtime to train. Mm -hmm. uh, but as soon as Sean came in, you know, we had Jimmy Kennedy and Josh were in here every day. Mike Boetta, Jake Herbert, all these guys were in there training with training right alongside our college guys. And I, that kind of helped us start building. Um, when I came in as a freshman, we had, you know, Josh was on the team, Tannenbaum, Steve Bluth, Tyrell Todd. Uh, so I came into a really good team and started right away. So I was able to learn kind of good habits from those guys. And then you know, we kind of had a, had a few down years and then, you know, I've been, it's kind of cool because I've been here, you know, my freshman year, we were really good. Like you said, we kind of had a little bit of a rough patch there. And then I've been here since we've been rebuilding. So it's been awesome to be, you know, see those guys start to mature and, and kind of get to where we're at right now. And when did the new facility open? It opened up in uh, 2010. Okay. So I was kind of right in the middle of my career. We moved over to here. So, so that's also been, been a huge plus for recruiting and, and just coming in every day, being able to see some, see, see some light through the windows uh, is really nice. Dude, it's just, uh, for the folks who haven't been, it's standalone facility, just immaculate. I, I love uh, I love going there. The first time I went, the Big Tens were in Michigan, and you have to remind me of what year, maybe 2010, 2011, but uh, we snuck over there, and it was unlocked, and we kind of just peeked our heads in the door. I'm like, oh, my God, this place is incredible. I mean, it's just, are there many standalone facilities in the country? No, I think we're one of three uh, standalone facilities. You know, Cornell has their own as well. And um, yeah. so, yeah, we're really lucky. Yeah, tw yeah the Big Tens were in uh, 2010. So that was actually okay. my redshirt year. So the one year they were here when I was in college, I didn't get a wrestle. But, um, but yeah, it's been awesome having a new facility here. It's, it's incredible. And you mentioned your career. Man, there has been so many different turning points and just different inflection points I noticed throughout your career. But I wanted to start with one. Did you not start your sophomore year in high school and you also won Fargo? <laughs> what the yeah. hell happened? Yeah. Tough. So, so I was a 103 pounder my freshman year. Um, had, had a good year. Got second at Ironman, second at Beast, uh, won national preps. Uh, kind of hit a growth spurt right in the middle of the year. So I was having a hard time getting down. Uh, you know, wrestled all spring and summer, came back. Um, I just had grown a lot. So I was between 19 and 25. Uh, I both, you know, my best friend was at 125. My other best friend was at 119. Uh, so I decided I opted to go 125 just because I didn't want to cut as much weight. Um, I think I lost double overtime in about 15 wrestle offs throughout the year. Oh, um, so yeah, it was, I just, I just could just, just couldn't get it there. And, um, so I was kind of on the B, B squad that year and went around and wrestled a few different tournaments. Um, and then it came into springtime. I was kind of feeling bad for myself because 
you know, I didn't get to wrestle at national preps, didn't get to wrestle Iron Man or Beast. I wrestled a handful of duels throughout the year. And uh, I just kind of remember I was walking through campus and uh, I was, I was thinking about, you know, playing a spring sport and Buxton kind of, you know, caught me walking to class one day, pulled me aside. Like he always does. Of course, I'm a little nervous, <laughs> a scary guy. You're always scared when you see, <laughs> see Buxton coming up to you. And he kind of sat me down and he's like, well, what do you want to accomplish in wrestling? And I'm like, well, you know, I want to win NCAA title. You know, I want to be, a, I want to win Olympic gold medal. And he's like, well, you have the skill set to do that, but you got to commit hundred percent. He's like, you can play a spring sport if you want, but if you want to win Fargo this summer, you got to start training right now. And so that kind of was like the kick in the butt that I needed. And I kind of had, you know, I was reinvigorated to start training hard, get, you know, I had another goal in mind to win Fargo. It doesn't matter what happened previously. I was mm-hmm. focused on Fargo and we had a good spring and summer and, you know, I was able to win Fargo that year um, as a second year cadet. So, so that kind of fired me up for that next year. And it just kind of kept rolling from there. And were you not 100% bought in before that point? You know, I think I was bought in, but it was just for me, you know, I always wanted to be the starting guy and, and it was a good lesson for me to learn early on mm-hmm. uh, in my high school career as a sophomore, where just because you have a successful year, the year before doesn't mean you're going to get anything the next year. Uh, especially at a place like Blair where, you know, there's multiple guys fight for the same spot. And if they were on other high school teams, they'd probably be top 15 guys in the country. And, and I kind of realized like, all right, I got to keep working every day, every day you got to get a little bit better. And uh, you know, if you keep working, that's going to pay off in the end. And even though I wasn't a starter that year, I still won Fargo. Uh, so that was kind of like where I'm like, all right, it doesn't matter where you're at right now. Just keep working every day. And you're going to get there. Yeah. And it's, I feel like sometimes, we focus on Americans in particular focus on like that season or that year. Whereas I was talking to someone last week and I think it was Brian Medlin's like for the Russians, everything before the Olympics is just feedback. It's just a feedback loop, you know? And so it's cool that you had that perspective then to kind of say, all right, forget what happened previously. Let's just go all forward with it. Um, I mean, did you ever think about transferring out or did your dad ever want you to transfer out when you weren't starting knowing you were one of the top guys in the country? No, my parents have always been really supportive. I got, I got really lucky. My dad it was actually one of the Blair coaches when I was there. And uh, he would drive almost 100 miles a day. He was, he was a middle school phys ed teacher in New Jersey. So, you know, he'd wake up, go to, go to work, go teach all day. And then he'd drive up to, to Blair to help out. And he was a very, you know, when, when I was younger, he was my, my main coach. Um, mm-hmm. But once I got to high school, he kind of was like, hey, Buxton, you know, he's yours. You do what you want. I'm going to hang out with the heavyweights. He wrestled with a lot of heavyweights, uh, bigger guys on the Blair team, kind of coach those guys. But he was, he was always very hands off. It was my decision, you know, where to go. And, and for him, I think he realized that transferring wouldn't be the answer. That would be the easy way out yeah. to transfer and go wrestle somewhere else instead of every day having to go in the room and fight for my own spot. And that's kind of, kind of the way that, that the whole Blair room was at that time where everyone was in there and, and they knew any day that the guy next to him could beat him for the spot but we all kept getting better together. Man, that's just a razor's edge that you guys are on in there every day going at it. Is it true that Buxton used to use like boxing gloves and like gladiator type <laughs> things to encourage, uh, encourage combat? Yeah, we had, uh, we had some boxing gloves. They got taken away about my junior year in high school. <laughs> um, Cause we'd be, we'd be what, how the old room was, it was like uh, sort of like the St. Ed's room. If guys had been there, except it was like divided into two separate rooms. So we, there was an indoor track above it. And we had a horizontal rope. So, you know, Buxton would lock the room and we'd go in there and you could climb down the horizontal rope from the indoor track. Yeah. And we'd be down there having like a little fight club. <laughs> um, and then eventually he's like, all right, this is getting, this is getting out of hand. We had to get these things away. Um, but then, yeah, we had those gladiator sticks that we, you know, we put a football helmet on and kind of fight. And, you know, we'd be like slap boxing during practice just to kind of, you know, keep that competitive edge against, against each other without just wrestling all the time. So he was really good at finding ways to, to get us to compete against each other, you know, outside of wrestling, which I think kind of, you know, fueled our competitive nature. Yeah. I mean, think about a guy, I don't know if he was there, he was probably gone, but like a Steve Mako guy with that gladiator stick. <laughs> get the heck out of here, man. That's crazy. Yeah. I, I, I would not have been picking the sticks. Up with <laughs> Mako, that's for sure. Now I understand that uh, you mentioned your dad was a high school coach and you really got started in it super young, but it was the Red Hawk club. That was like the turning point for you. What, what happened there and who were some of the guys in there that, that set the tone for you? Yeah. So I kind of, I started going there around, you know, third and fourth grade. I was wrestling for uh, my local, you know, kids club. I started out, my dad was coaching at a different high school. So I started out there 
with actually the guy who beat, beat me out for the spot at 125. He was from that town, uh, Max Shanneman. He was, you know, a really good high school wrestler. Okay. And uh, so me and him were wrestling when we were, you know, four and five years old. He had an older brother that was wrestling. Um, and then we actually ended up reuniting at Blair and stuff. And you know, wow. we're still really good friends to this day, even though we were, you know, fierce competitors. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, I started out there, went to my local, local, you know, Peewee league. And I just, I wanted to wrestle more. And uh, luckily they had the Red Hawk club about 30 minutes from my house. And, you know, we had guys like all the Kasulis, Mike Rogers, uh, this guy, Luke Grassi, he's really good. He was kind of my main workout partner back then. And uh, John Mangini, all these guys that were winning Tulsa and winning, you know, all these huge, you know, Reno, all these little kid tournaments. Yep. And so I was around those guys all the time. But at the time I wasn't, you know, I was all right, but I wasn't that good. Like I never won a state state title when I was little until I was like seventh grade or eighth grade. Um, so just being around those guys and be able to train with them. So we had like an unbelievable room in there with guys that ended up, you know, having success in high school and college. Uh, but yeah, it was just an awesome club and it was, you know, a little gritty. It was, you know, in Phillipsburg and a little rougher area. So, so it was kind of, you know, we were scrapping every day. We'd have, we had all the trophies up on the wall, and, you know, once or twice in practice, someone would hit the wall and the trophies would all fall down. <laughs> um, so, you know, it was just one of those places where, you know, it was gritty. Like you had, you had it, you knew you were going to be in a, be in a fight there, no matter who you pick. Dude, I heard the jersey you've seen is absolutely insane with some of the, the crazy parents and just the competitiveness is through the roof. Yeah, I mean, we had some parents, they actually had to build a wall in there because it was just like an open room um, before and parents would be like walking out in the mat and yelling at the kids trying to coach each other <laughs> against them. And uh, I still remember, you know, some some of the guys I'd be wrestling with, they're like, hey, you know, my dad's watching. Can, can I take you down? You know, <laughs> or else my dad's gonna be really mad. I'll be like, all right, I guess. I mean, whatever. Like my, like my dad's always been, you know, he, he actually, everywhere he goes, he gets invited to coach. Cause I think the coaches realize he's very knowledgeable. He's one of the, he started wrestling in high school. Mm -hmm. He had no idea what he was doing really. He, uh, his first match actually, they had only wrestled on their feet in practice. Yeah. So he thought you only wrestled on your feet. So his first <laughs> match, he goes out and he wrestles a guy like double legs him, puts him to his back and pins him. He gets back up, puts his foot on the line and the ref's like, no, dude, the match is over. He's like, well, <laughs> what do you mean? We, he just took me down. We just go another takedown. And, oh, you know, boy. Just, but he's got just a passion, like unparalleled for the sport. And he's, you know, the type of guy that's always picking people's brains. And, you know, even now he calls me and asks me about different stuff. And uh, so I think they, you know, all the coaches that I've been around have realized like, oh, uh, this guy, he just, he just loves wrestling. He wants to help everybody in the room. He's not there to, you know, he's there to help me, but he's not just going to prioritize me. He wants to help everybody. Um, so, yeah, but it, it, the, the Jersey wrestling scenes, it's pretty, it gets pretty wild in those tournaments. Is it, is it like one organization for the middle school champ or do they have like two different competing organizations or is it one like middle school state champ? So they have, they have one, there, there's two, there's two big ones. There's like the North Jersey States, you know, everyone kind of wrests, all the good guys wrestle on both, but there's uh, the regular, you know, New Jersey and Jay, whatever it is, uh, yep. youth league. And then they have a South Jersey state tournament, which is a true wrestle back. So you can lose and still win. Um, the whole so thing. Lose. Yeah. So you, so you, there's, it's a lot smaller of a bracket. I think there's three qualifiers, maybe four. Okay. Um, and then there's, you know, a 16 man bracket and you can lose first round. And if you wrestle all the way back through the, through the wrestlebacks, you still get a wrestle for first place. So that oh, was always wow. a fun tournament. Yeah. To wrestle in. And I don't know if they still, I'm, I'm assuming they still do it. I haven't, you know, followed the youth in New Jersey for a while, but that was always a fun tournament that we got to wrestle in because, you know, even if you made all the way to the finals, you know, and win that finals match, doesn't mean it's over. You, you still got to wrestle another match or two. So does the second, I've never heard of any tournament doing that. So does the second place guy wrestle the third place guy and that guy wrestles again, the champ? Is that how it works? Yeah. So, yeah. So if you, if you wow. make all the third and then I think it's, I can't remember if it's best two or three or what, but yeah, you, you can lose and, and wrestle all the way back, back and win. So it's, it, it's a pretty cool tournament and you know, it's, South Jersey is really good area for wrestling too. So, so it gets really competitive, even just to qualify for it. It just sounds gritty. The South Jersey oh, yeah. middle school state championships that those are some yeah. gems in that crowd. My God. So was it hard for someone like you to, you know, big East coast guy with all these roots to, to go to the Midwest? Like I would have pictured yet like a Lehigh or, or something like that. Yeah. So it, it kind of came down between Lehigh and, and Michigan really. Um, you know, I was really familiar with the Lehigh wrestling program, grew up, you know, going to the snake pit and watching those matches with my dad. 
Uh, obviously, there's a huge Blair Lehigh connection. Yep. Uh, you know, just especially from from when I was there, and and I was pretty much all set on going to Lehigh, and I was about to you know verbally commit, and Michigan came out, and I talked to them, and then they actually came out to talk to me and Max Shannon. And Max really wanted to go to Michigan and uh, they wanted us to come on a visit. And Buxton's like, I was kind of, you know, going wishy-washy, like, I don't know if I'm going to go, you know, I really like Lehigh. I'm comfortable here. And he sat me down. He's like, you, know, you got to at least see a big 10 school. Like you can't just go with what's comfortable, see, see what else is out there. And I went out there to, to kind of just hang out with Max and, and see what it was all about. And as soon as I got out there, I was like, I can see myself here. You yeah. Know, way different than where I came from. I came from a really small town in New Jersey. I think I graduated with like 50 kids in my middle school, went to Blair. I graduated with like, with like a hundred kids in my class. And then I come to Michigan and, you know, there's 10,000 undergrads in my, in my graduating or in my, you know, freshman class. So it was very different, but, but to wrestle in the big 10, there was just nothing like it. And, and at the time I was, you know, I was, I got to talk to Josh and Ty and Steve and all these guys that were all American national finalists. And, and they were just telling me, man, you got to wrestle in the big 10. Like that's where it's at. And uh, that kind of got me hungry. And as soon as I came back from my, for my visit, I was called Lehigh up and I'm like, Hey, um, I'm not going to be coming to you guys. I'm going to Michigan. And I called the Michigan coaching staff and, and told them I was going. So it was one of those things. It was kind of like a 180 from, you know, once I stepped foot, I knew, you know, this is a place where I got to be. I got to be in Ann Arbor. I got to be wrestling for the maize and blue. And uh, it was just, it was, it was very eye opening once I got out here just to see a school like this. That, I mean, the Michigan is one of the icons in all of college sports in terms of just like athletic excellence. You see the big house. I mean, it's just, it's the traditions right there. I mean, there's a ton of schools like that. Ohio state's right there, but I mean, to go out there and see that it's pretty cool. And so that was your only big 10 recruiting visit though. Yeah. Yeah, I took a few wow. other some a- ACC schools and stuff like that, and I was talking to a few other ones, but but yeah, it was the only Big Ten school that I came out to. Wow, I mean, and for folks who don't know, and I'll mention it in the show notes, two-time Fargo champ, um, you know, at the junior level and second your senior year, and so I mean, super highly recruited. Um, but like you said, though, Michigan had a squad back then, and those guys were tight. You know, like that was an, a tight knit group. Yeah, yeah, I mean, everyone. As soon as I got here, I was like, man, these guys. They hang out together, they eat together, they train together. And it's, you know, it was, it was really good. You know, it, was, it reminded me a lot of Blair. Like mm-hmm. everyone there, everyone at Blair expected to win. Everyone at Michigan expected to win. And that was just the culture of the team at the time. And uh, so it felt really familiar to me. And it was just something that I was like, man, I need to be part of this. Now you got off to a blazing start. True freshman, right? Yep. And you, you won the Cliff Keen, beat Jaggers. That was a big turning point. But from what I was reading just ahead of time, you and Chirella had some workouts in the room as an early freshman where he kind of introduced you to college wrestling. What what do you remember from those transitionary months before you really broke onto the scene later that winter? Oh, yeah, those first couple months. And I, and I tell our freshmen every year because, you know, I was just especially this year, it's really hard for those guys because they don't get to wrestle in open tournament. So oh, when you yeah. come when you come in, when you come in as a freshman and you're wrestling these guys that are sophomore, junior, seniors, fifth year, seniors, grad students, and they've been in that room, they just and they, they, they kick your butt every day. <laughs> and I just remember, you know, after a month in college, I was like talking to my dad. I'm like, man, this is like, this is not high school. These, every one of these guys is good. Even guys I'd never heard of that were second and third string, you know, they were, they were beating me or, you know, I wasn't able to take them down. And I don't think I got my first takedown on Josh until probably early November or something like that. And uh, just being in the room every day like that. But then you get to your first open tournament and you get, start getting some wins and you realize like, all right, I could do this, but those first few months are definitely tough where it's a huge learning curve, uh, especially the mat wrestling. You know, I was a pretty good mat wrestler in high school, but when you get to college, it's different with that riding time. So it definitely took me, I, I definitely took my lumps the first few months and, and I was definitely like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. So I finally got to start beating up some other guys. It's crazy that even a guy who came from Blair, I mean, you guys were, your teams there were unbelievable. You still experience that. And so that, and usually I'll ask folks who, who maybe come from a smaller school, but yeah, you know, I, I just never imagined that. And so, but then again, you got Josh Torella, who's an animal, you know? So what are you going to do? Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I definitely felt lucky that I came from Blair because I think I took it better than a lot of the other freshmen in my class that, you know, like you're saying, they came from a smaller school where they're used to being the big dog. Mm-hmm. I came from Blair where, you know, I was one of the better guys in the room, but the guys, you know, the weight below me, the two weights above me, we were all top five in the, in the country. So yeah. we, I was used to having to battle every day, but 
you know, battling every day is different than getting your butt kicked every day. <laughs> on Josh and those guys. So, so it was definitely, you know, I think I took it better than those guys coming from Blair, but it was definitely still a rough few months. Well, and the, the crazy part about that is, you know, as a starter, as you were, you know, the early part of the year, you're getting some momentum, you're going to tournaments, you're winning, but then you hit that big 10 grind. What, I mean, people say that, and I never wrestled in college, so I don't know what it means. Like, is it that the practices are getting on you? Is it the traveling? Is it the weight cut? I mean, what happens in that early February where it just really starts to, to, to wear on, on some of the younger guys? Yeah, I think the big, you know, it's a little bit of everything, but it's definitely just wrestling other big 10 guys. I mean, yeah, chances are you're going to be wrestling a top 10 guy every weekend. So yeah, you have no, you know, easy, easy weekends. Um, you're also cutting weight, you're in school. Um, you know, the, the college season is just longer than the high school season. Right. So especially com coming from Blair, we kind of had all of our tough tournaments in the beginning of the year. And then we, you know, had some tough duels, but we were wrestling other prep schools where, you know, you might have an, have a couple easier matches. And then you have, you know, national preps, which, which is going to be tough. Uh, where in college, you know, you have the open tournaments, which you're going to wrestle some good guys, but you might have some easier matches. And then especially once you get into the Big Ten season, there's no slouches. You have a guy's, you know, not ranked. He's still in the Big Ten room every day, and he's going to fight. No one's going to give you give you an easy match. And I think mentally that just kind of wears on some guys. Where if you're not used to that competitive nature every day, that it just you know your body starts to break down a little bit. Then your mind starts breaking down, and and it's kind of hard once you start going down that going down that road of negativity. You got to reset and and get ready for the next match. And I heard that one of the things you used to do to kind of get through that is each practice, you'd break it down and you had a plan for a specific practice. When did you start doing that? Uh, that's some, I just, you know, think as, as a, you know, boxing always, always harp that where, you know, you got to come into practice with a game plan and, and Joe McFarland, who was the head coach for me, he was the same way. He's like, you can't just, you know, walk in and put your shoes on and get ready to wrestle. You got, you got to sit down and think about what you, what you want to accomplish, whether that's, you know, I want to get a takedown on Josh today, or I'm not going to let Josh turn me or, or, or something like that. And, and it's just something that I've always done. And it kind of helps me by winning, you know, I set, set small goals. And once you, you know, accomplish that small goal, you get a little boost mm -hmm. and then you can go to the next goal. And then the next goal, where if your whole goal is just to be a national champ, it's hard to keep that motivation all year. So I always try to set little goals and practice every day, whether, you know, especially as I got older, uh, you know, and Sean and Donnie really helped me my senior year in practice, you know, especially we're doing individuals, right? You know, you need to get three takedowns in three minutes on this guy. And all that guy's trying to do is not get taken down. <laughs> so, you know, there, there was a few where I'd be, you know, cursing, walking out of the room because they were trading guys off on me, you know, and I was, you know, exhausted. And they're like, well, we're not leaving until you get a takedown. You got to get this last takedown. And I'm like, this is, this is BS. You know, these guys are fresh and they're, you know, and you know, they would sit me down and be like, yeah, well, if you were fresh, you get all the takedowns on these guys. We're trying to, we're trying to make you as exhausted as possible. And uh, it's just, you know, it's, you know, you, sometimes you got to just go in the, like everyone says, you got to go in those dark places. And if you have a little goal in that dark place, it gets a little lighter every time. Yeah. I mean, that it gives you something to, to hang your hat on. I mean, even if you get taken down 35 times, but you accomplish the things you're working on, at least you can walk out of there with some, with some positive momentum. Cause if not, like you said, you get a couple bad days in a row, you have a bad weight cut, you lose a duel. Next thing you know, it starts to spiral quick. Yeah. I mean, that happened to me a little bit my freshman year. I got, got kind of sick and I had a bad match. And, you know, I, I think I started out like 18 and 0 or 19 and 0 my freshman year. And then, you know, I hit that big 10 and, and I lost a few close matches and guys I beat earlier. And it's one of the, it just kind of snowballs. And uh, I was able to kind of, you know, I, I worked with a really good sports psychologist all through high school and college and after. And he was kind of able to help me reset and, and get my mind right for those big 10 NCAA tournaments. So really, so all the way through high school, the same one. Or? Yeah. So I started my sophomore year, um, you know, right, right before I was wrestling in Fargo that year, I just I had a little bit of boxing called an anger problem. Um, <laughs> I was just, you know, you're whatever, 15, 16 years old. And I was a little chippy and I think I was at cadet duels and I got, you know, I didn't give up a lot of points, but I think, you know, 80% of my points were all penalty points just because I get so mad and, you know, do something stupid. Like, like a high school kid would do. Yep. And he pulled me aside. Well, he didn't pull me aside. He kind of pushed me against the wall. I was like, you know, you gotta get your shit together or else, you know, you're not going to make it. And luckily he uh, was, you know, had been talking to this, uh, Dr. Jared Spencer. Um, he's a mind of the athlete guy. He's, he's awesome sports psychologist. You know, one of my best friends right now. 
And uh, he, you know, I started meeting with him once a week and I kind of continued that all through high school. And then in college, I did a little bit. And then once I kind of hit that slump, you know, kind of texted me, I was like, Hey, if you want to start working together, like, let's, let's just start talking, see what's going on with you. And he kind of helped me through that, you know, college rough patch and then mm-hmm. uh, kind of all, all the way through my career. And so when you work with someone like that, do you have a, a set agenda going into it or do you just start talking and then throughout that hour, something unfolds? In the beginning, it's kind of a set agenda going through, you know, what's going on in wrestling, what's going on in your personal life. Um, you know, how, how's it going with your friends, your girlfriend, your parents. And then as we, like, by the time I was a senior in high school, we kind of built a, you know, we had known each other enough where we could just kind of go in and, and, and see what's going on. And we did a lot of visualization, did a lot of just, you know, you know, problem solving with different areas of, of you know, my personal life and wrestling. Cause it's, it's really hard in college, even in high school to be, you know, a high level athlete dealing with school, mm-hmm. social life, all of that. And I think it's kind of an underutilized tool in a lot of wrestling programs, um, just being able to, you know, be able to work towards that peak performance. And he kind of helped me, gave me some cues about, you know, if you get really angry, you gotta, you know, you gotta, this is what's going to reset you. And a big thing, you know, that we used to do was, you know, I'd have to go like this, Mm -hmm. touch the tips of my fingers. So, you know, some guys watch some of my high school matches, even some of my college, every time I go out of bounds and I'm walking back to the center, I'll be like, hit my fingers. And everyone's always like, what are you doing? Like I'm resetting. You know, I'm resetting wow. for this next whistle start. And that was probably like the biggest, you know, learning all about that and just learning, you know, everyone knows that you have, have to, you know, recenter, refocus. But once you learn kind of the, the mechanics of what's going on in your brain, it just makes it that much easier to actually do it and be able to mentally reset. And so he broke all that down for you. Yeah. So he, you know, he would give me books to read, um, books three, different articles, uh, different videos on visualization. And just, cause I, I was always one of those guys where someone's like, Oh, just visualize. I was like, but why, why, why are we doing this? You know, I think every wrestler is kind of, it's a very individual sport. So if, if you don't, if you don't really understand why you're doing something, then you might be a little hesitant to do it. And he was, he was a good high school wrestler. He played college football. So it was another thing where once I realized I'm like, Oh, he knows wrestling. Mm-hmm. He knows about weight cutting. He knows about, all that goes into being a successful wrestler, it, it kind of, you know, I was, I was bought in a hundred percent once I got to know him and, and knew how much he knew about wrestling. That is so huge to have credibility in that space. Otherwise it would be hard to, I don't want to say that blanketly because I'm sure there's a lot of great minds out there who could help people who haven't wrestled, but as a high school kid, you know, where you're kind of skeptical of it anyway, I mean, you know, it, it's probably nerve wracking for a high school kid to go to a sports psychologist, or maybe there's a stigma to it. And obviously your dad was, and coach bucks are way ahead of their time, but, um, to have that credibility had to go a long way. What did you implement or any type of practices outside of the finger touching to help manage stress? You know, once you got into some of those big, big 10 and NCA matches, I think just, just constant kind of, you know, mantras, like my mantra was always relentless attack. Mm-hmm. And so before matches, if my mind started wandering, I would just, in my head, I was just constantly relentless attack, relentless attack, relentless attack. So I did a lot of, he, he told me how to do a lot of self-speak and I kind of, yeah. I mean, people kind of laugh when I tell them, but I'd be like walk, you know, doing the pace thing before, before a big match. And I was just like, man, I'm a bad mother. You know, yeah. no one wants to wrestle me right now. Like that guy over there, he's scared. Like I would just, just constantly have this going through my mind the whole time. So when I stepped <laughs> on the mat, I already knew the guy was scared of me. I'm like this guy doesn't want to be out here. So all I got to do is push him to the edge and he's going to fall right off. And so he taught me a lot of, you know, visualization before matches, a lot of self, self-talk, uh, just a lot of ways to kind of refocus and, and, and be able to dig deep and win. Dude, I love that you would get yourself hyped up like that. It reminds me of Jake Herbert came on here. He, has, he said the same thing. He'd be <laughs> back there just pacing. He's like, that's my title. It's a threat to my family that you're yeah. coming out here. He said some crazy. So it sounds like you were very similar, though, in that sense. Yeah. And I was lucky enough to, you know, I trained along Herbert for a few years when he was out here and. And he was one of those guys too that really taught me, especially once I got to that senior level. I mean, he he would go into practice and he would get his butt kicked, but he'd come back in the locker room and be like, "Hey, you see that takedown I got? You see that throw I got?" I'm like, "Yeah, but you you gave up like 40 points." He's like, "Yeah, who cares about that? But did you did you see what happened? Did you see me get that throw?" I'm like, "Oh, all right. So this still works at the senior level. I got I got to keep setting those little goals and and be happy with 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 when I'm you know with what I've been developing actually works." 
So, and he was known as a guy who would give up those practice points and not, not, not take it personal. You, some guys are wound up so tight that it, you know, people have said that giving up a takedown would ruin him for a week, but Herbert would, you know, just had that easy goingness where he could really see what was going on in there. Yeah. I mean, before he won that, when he came back and he won the U S open and made the world team, I think he got tech followed right before the, the match, like as a warm up, he did a warm up match with one of our college guys and he was just getting like ragdolled and we're all like, Oh, this is not gonna be good, man. He's wrestling Ed Ruth. The finals. <laughs> like this is gonna be ugly. Yikes! <laughs> but then he goes out and wins, and we're like, "That's Jake." Can't oh, expect anything different. God. It's like that. Yeah. Uh, it's like that gif, like that he walks off the mat. Everyone's like, "Yikes, dude! That's <laughs> that's a tough one." I mean, I, I, someone like you, you seem like you're just an A type player, always on your game. I mean, when you were like going to practice and and wrestling and setting these high performance goals, would it bother you if, if you would get taken on or do you have that kind of foresight early on to, to look at the positives? I mean, I would definitely be upset if I gave up a takedown um, and it would kind of fire me up to wrestle, you know, even harder. Mm -hmm. But my mindset was always, you know, when I step across that line onto the mat for practice, you know, what happens there, you know, as soon as I step off the mat, I just, you know, got to reset and think about the positive, positive mm -hmm. things that happen. If you dwell on the negative, it just keeps feeding that negative monster and, and, you know, it just, it'll ruin your whole day and, and you're not going to learn anything if you focus just on the negative all the time. Right. So, you know, it, I let it fire me up in practice, but I never let it carry over, you know, outside of practice. Cut it off when you leave the room. I like that. Yeah. Now going into your junior year, I know you had a, a gnarly staff that kept kind of coming up throughout college. Is that why you redshirted? Yeah. So, uh, end of my sophomore year, you know, I was get I had really bad, uh, bursitis, you know, pretty common wrestling injury. Uh, I had it I probably my right knee. I probably had it I don't know, between high school and college, like 18 to 20 times, you know, I'd bang it and swell up. And, uh, towards the end, you know, I had to wrestle, you know, it was big tens NCAAs were coming up. So I kept getting it drained and drained and drained. And, uh, the doctor was like, man, you, you're probably going to get an infection if we keep doing this. But, you know, it's one of those things where I had to do it. So I was on antibiotics all the end of the year. Oof. And, uh, you know, it, it kept coming back a little bit in the summer. And my, my first practice back uh, after NCA is I was helping Josh get ready for the U.S. Open. And he kind of shot, shot a high crotch and, you know, lifted me up. And I landed on my hand and I tore a ligament in my thumb. And uh, they were, and so I decided, you know, the doctor's like, well, you need to get surgery on that. So if we do that, let's, let's clean out your knee and, and get rid of that that bursa sac too and so all all spring and summer that year my my right hand was in a cast and my right knee was in a full brace <laughs> so my whole right side of the body was like immobilized and uh so you know that was a couple months and uh you know my hand healed up fine my knee was all right and uh you know at the beginning of the year uh sat down with joe and he's like all right let's see how your knee does in the fall and you know, I'd wrestle a little bit and it'd swell back up I'd and it'd go down and wrestle a bit, swell back up. Even after and the then, surgery? Even after the surgery. Yeah. That had to be so, disheartening. Oh my God. Yeah. So I was, you know, I'd be on the mat one day, be off the mat for a week, be on the mat one day off. And they were uh, on a trip like early, probably like late November, early December. And I woke up and my knee was just, you know, like a watermelon. It was throbbing. So I took a picture and I sent it to my trainer and they were on a road trip and he was like, send me a picture of the newspaper. I think you're just like pulling my leg. That's from before the surgery. And so as a joke, you know, I sent him the picture and he's like, all right, you need to see the doctor right now. And, uh, the, the guy who did my knee surgery was at a basketball game at Michigan working it. And he calls me up. He's like, Hey, Callan, I saw the picture Come to the basketball game right now. And he looks at it and he's like, yeah, you're going to the hospital tonight. And, uh, so hospital, how like, big is this thing yeah. for reference? Like, like the size oh, of your fist? Oh no, it was like two or three fists. Like oh. I was wearing like baggy sweatpants and he was like pushing the sweat. Like I, I went to class that day and my teacher's like, I don't think you should be here. Like you need to go, go see somebody. I'm like, yeah, I'm seeing the doctor later. It'll be fine. It really hurts, but <laughs> you know, whatever. And uh, so I went in, doctor was awesome. He actually had done all this research to, to try to find the best way to, to get all the infection out. And I go in, um, you know, he's, he's like, I have, sur I have like, you know, four or five surgeries tonight. I'm just going to stay late. And I'm going to do your surgery. And so, you know, I go in, they put me under, you know, I wake up and all these nurses, it's like two in the morning. I have a couple of you know, teammates come to check on me and the nurses are like, all right, well, who's picking me up? Well, the doctor told me I'm staying here. And like, oh, we didn't know that because it was a last minute surgery. 
So I end up sitting, you know, in the post-op room for like four or five hours while they're trying to get me a room. <laughs> I'm on IV antibiotics. I have a pump hooked to my knee. Uh, that's pulling all the fluid out. And so I end up, you know, going up to, they get me a room in the hospital. I'm, I'm in there for about a week on, on IV antibiotics. A uh, week? A pic- yeah. And they put a pick line in my arm. So for, it was like eight weeks, I had to inject myself with antibiotics three days a week through the pick line. And I had this like pump that was connected to the bottom of my knee that was pulling fluid out of the knee the whole time. So I was walking to class, like with a purse on over my shoulder with this pump connected <laughs> to my knee. And I'm sitting in class and the thing, you know, it's like a suction. So it just start randomly be like, <laughs> out of my knee. everyone's like, look around, like, what is going on? I'm like, don't worry about it. And so that, you know, that was, that kind of put a halt to me coming back later in the season. And, and I was out for another six months, um, just so they want to be really careful with it, make sure it didn't come back. And, you know, the doctor did a really good job. It did, you know, our trainer did an awesome job rehabbing, but for about a full year, I was probably only on the mat a handful of times until about August that year. Man. So was there ever any actual damage to the knee or was the staff the whole time? No, it was just the staff. It was just, it was in that bursa sack and it just like wow. it had been, you know, ruptured so many times. It was so deformed that it couldn't pull the fluid back in. So the first surgery, they tried to take, you know, 80% of the bursa sac out because it'll regrow. Mm-hmm. And when it regrew, it regrew with the infection. So they had to go back in and take the whole thing out. And luckily, you know, it's been good. It's been 10 years. So I haven't had any problems since then. Knock wood, dude. Man, yeah, that's yeah. that's crazy. And even uh, it just add, adding to that year of just, you know, not wrestling, you're out of your routine. I know you didn't finish your sophomore year the way you wanted to. And so that had to be playing on your mind. I mean, where were you at mentally during this, this period of lingo? Yeah. I, I, you know, I was, I, I was pretty, you know, pretty negative headspace in general. I mean, our team wasn't having a good year. Um, so, you know, I was frustrated with that, trying to help guys, you know, you know, develop all year while I was, you know, in crutches and in my knee in, you know, immobilized. Um, but for me, you know, I was fired up to, to wrestle all that summer. You know, I wanted to, you know, redeem myself the year, the summer before I lost to Burroughs in the junior final. So for the world team. So I wanted to get back and make a junior world team. Mm-hmm. And, um, so not being able to wrestling, you know, be able to wrestle was kind of killing me, but in hindsight, it was a really good thing moving forward because it made me stop and actually start like really deep diving into my wrestling and deep diving into other guys wrestling to because that was the only wrestling fix I could get was watching video and, and helping coach. And it's definitely helped develop me as a coach. Cause you know, that, that whole year, that's all I did was, was coach guys. I, I couldn't really work out. Um, you know, they didn't want me lifting or doing any kind of exercise for the first like three or four months. So it was the first time where I gave my body that much of a break. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I was kind of like, you know, a fifth coach on the staff at that point where I was able to, you know, bring guys in and, and help them watch film. And, and, it, and in the long run, it was really good for me, both college, post-college, and, and now as a coach. I mean, think about your body getting all rested up, you know, for the first time, probably since middle school, where you're not just pounding yeah. it. And then, and then all, you know, everyone always talks about, I wish I would have coached when I was wrestling because you step back and learn a little bit more. So you got to do that that whole year and then obviously came back on fire that junior year. Um, but as I was looking at it, though, the obstacles never stopped up until the last second when you sprained your ankle in that match. How, how severe was that? And like, how to kind of tell the people how that transpired? Yeah. I mean, that was, that hurt. That hurt bad. <laughs> I mean, luckily, you know, that when it first happened, it hurt and then the adrenaline starts pumping and, and it's not bad, but I definitely couldn't put a lot of weight on it. Um, and yeah, in the NCAA finals, I knew Boris really well. We've known each other since high school. You know, we wrestled in college. Uh, so I knew it was going to be a dog fight. And once I rolled that ankle, I was, you know, just, again, I just had to reset right away. My trainer ran out, taped my knee, you know, taped the ankle over the shoe. You know, Joe was whistling right here. He's like, Hey man, you got to get out. You got to get out right now. You got to get out. All right. And uh, so I was able to do that. And then, you know, after, once I, you know, got off that stage is when I really was like, I can't walk on this thing. And, you know, I came back, got, got some x-rays. They're like, all right, nothing's broken, but if, you probably would have healed faster if you broke your ankle. So I ended up being in a walking boot for like, like a month and a half. So I was off the mat for a little bit, able to kind of let my body heal from the college season. But, you know, mentally it was, it was definitely really tough. I had to, you know, right away I had to push those negative thoughts out when I'm taking injury time and, and refocus on, it doesn't matter how much pain you're in, you got to find a way to win. Yeah. You know, I was, I always thought I was going to win when I stepped out there and it was no different whether I got hurt or I was a hundred percent. 
I got to go back to the clip and see if I'm seeing any finger motion during the injury timeout. <laughs> Man, it's just, uh, it, I'm just amazed at how, um, you know, persistent, you know, champions are. And if you look at that stretching from your freshman year to your sophomore year, didn't end how you wanted to your junior year, undefeated all year long. And then two overtimes on Friday. I mean, nail biters. And then to the finals where you, you're, you know, it's a tight match. you bang your ankle up. Then you finally win. I mean, what, what were you like, like the Tuesday or Wednesday afterwards? Were you just, I mean, did it finally set in at that point? Yeah. I think, you know, once you get back to Ann Arbor and, and you start going to class and people kind of realize like, you know, oh, they saw, they saw my picture in the daily or something like that. It was pretty cool when guys, you know, started saying congratulations to me. And it was definitely, you know, one of those things where I was really happy that I won, but I knew, you know, I, I have something to defend now. And I got to train even harder once I can to, to be able to come back and win the next year. Cause I know everyone's going to be gunning for me. Yeah. Uh, you know, my senior year. How would you describe the training your first semester when you were, I think you were doing a part-time teaching, um, but also training. Was it hard to, to kind of flip that switch and get back in the groove? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was exhausting. You know, I was, I was a phys ed major. So I was student teaching the whole first semester. Uh, I started out the first eight weeks. I was, I was in elementary school. So I was, you know, dealing with <laughs> elementary school kids all day. And, you know, they can be pretty exhausting. And I was lucky that, you know, Jimmy Kennedy was here. And because uh, I didn't get at, I didn't get done teaching till 340 every day when I was in the elementary school. So, you know, I'd, I'd wake up, you know, maybe get a light workout in, in the morning, then go teach from you know, 830 to 340, rush over here to practice till it's coming late. Jimmy would be waiting, you know, sitting on the side of the mat. Once I got there, we'd start warming up and get into practice. But, you know, mentally, I was just exhausted by the time I got to practice, just just teaching teaching all day. And then I went to the high school where, you know, I got out a little bit earlier, which was good. I got out at like two 30 mm-hmm. and I had to be there at seven 30. So again, it kind of cut back on some of those morning workouts. So I had to get up early, you know, go there. Luckily I was, I was really lucky. My, the, you know, my lead teacher, his dad actually wrestled here. It was Mike Rodriguez. So it was a three-time big 10 champ. He wrestled at Michigan state. And so he, he understood wrestling. So at least when I was sitting in the office, we got to talk about wrestling and, and stuff. So I got really lucky with that, but that first semester, I was definitely, definitely, you know, I think, you know, a little, little worn out by, yeah. by the end of it. It's just uh, crazy to think that, you know, most fifth year seniors, and I don't even know if this is true, but in my mind, I think maybe they're taking a couple of cl- classes and really just focusing in on wrestling. But to think you had a nine to five and we're still uh, <laughs> defending the national title is just crazy to me. Yeah, it was, it was definitely tough. A lot of guys that, that ended up, you know, that are teaching majors here, even Tyrell Todd did the same thing where they kind of graduate and then they do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just kind of worked out in my favor where I was supposed to be doing it the second semester. And I was like, I'm, I don't want a student teach the second semester. Like that's big tens, that's NCAs. That, that's, you know, that that's, that's championship season. I want to get it done first semester. So my advisor was able to finagle some things to get me in first semester, which I was, you know, really thankful for. And that second semester I had two classes, which, which was good, which is more of the fifth year yeah that we like dude the the student teaching during the second semester would have been insane um and and I, the reason i'm asking some of these questions is it's just cool to see you go through all these different you know different peaks and valleys and especially now that you're coaching you have so many lessons to share with these guys like what's been one of the biggest things that you didn't realize was part of the college coaching gig like when you took it um i think you know one of the biggest things for you know college coaching you know that I think it's just dealing with different kinds of mentalities. And, you know, I came from a place with Buxton and Joe and Sean and they're, you know, even Josh, all these, all these coaches I've been around are really good at managing different personalities. Mm-hmm. And, and it's something that I've, I'm really trying to develop. And, and I think I've done a good job where you can kind of link up with, with everybody on the team. And there's different guys that need different motivation. Some guys, you know, you need to be rah, rah, fire them up before a big match. Other guys like, like Stevan Michik is a perfect example. He, me and him will be laughing before his matches. Yeah. Like we'll be, we'll, we'll be joking around and, and, you know, cause he's, that's just the type of kid he is where he, he, he wrestles for fun. Like this is the most fun he's going to have all day is wrestling this match. And for him, you know, he's focused, but he's relaxed. And then, you know, other guys, you know, you gotta get him raised, you know, razor focus and get, you know, you, you gotta beat this guy up. You gotta dominate, you gotta dominate and, and give him that, give him that fired up speech. And uh, some guys you just gotta leave alone. Like for me, when I wrestled, I I, I wanted to be alone. Mm-hmm. Like coach would be standing next to me, but again, I was doing all that mental rehearsal, that that, that self talk. 
And that's all I needed. Like I was, I developed that on my own. And some guys, you got to do that self-talk for other guys. You got to, got to pull back and have them relax because they're getting too anxious. Yeah. And so for me, that's why I really like learning is, is, is just how different guys, you know, how, how they tick, how to get them motivated in practice, how to get them motivated before a match. Man, it's just such a fun, uh, never ending puzzle to figure out. I mean, kind of like wrestling technique, there's no end to it. Yeah, there's really, you know, there's no right or wrong way to get ready for a match. It's, it's how you're going to get to your peak performance. And whether that's self talk, visualization, you know, sit, sitting alone in a dark corner, just, you know, visualizing that win uh, or, you know, cracking a joke to try to get the guy to relax. So, so he's wrestling loose. Those Izzy style guys, you got to get them going, man. They, they're probably oh, ready to go waking to... up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Izzy gets in their ear, dude. Yeah, those guys, those guys you can scream at. They're, they're, they're used to it, man. They're, <laughs> they love it. They, they, they want it to be a brawl out there. So, so those guys, those guys are pretty easy. The guys that they got to calm down, they're, they're, the, they're the harder ones for sure. I love it. Now, when you were uh, transitioning onto the freestyle scene, did you ever go to the overtime facility or was that all shut down when you were kind of coming out of it? Yeah, I never got to go to overtime. Um, gotcha. It was always a bummer. I, I was supposed to go one summer and then I ended up not being able to go. So, uh, yeah, I, I never really got to be there and, and see, you know, all those training camps, but, but it looked awesome. Glory days, man. Those, those are yeah. some great, great rooms. Let's wind down with uh, just two quick questions and we'll let you go coach. All right. Awesome. You seem like a well-read man. You've mentioned books a couple of times. What are some of your favorite books that you've read over the past you know, five, 10 years? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, you know, one of the biggest ones that helped me mentally was uh, the Tiger Woods book. I can't remember what exactly it was called, but it was, I think it might've been Eye of the Tiger or something. And it was all about his mental approach to the golf game. And I remember, you know, uh, Jared Spencer handing it to me one day. He's like, you need to read this. I'm like, it's golf. And he's like, <laughs> Man, hit a ball in a hole. How, how tough can that be? <laughs> and, and, but when I started reading it, I'm like, man, this is like, he's on to something here, you know, visualizing every putt. You know, you hit a bad shot, refocus on the next one. And it was one of those things that really helped me realize, like, it doesn't matter what sport you are. There's little tricks that you can learn from everybody. Um, and so that, that's kind of one of my favorite books. And I've given that book to a few other guys uh, okay. just to read and get, get that mentality. Um, and then another one, I'm terrible with book names, but it was from, it was from Michael Jordan's who was it, personal trainer. Oh, Tim all- Grover. Yes. Yeah. So, so I read that book a few years ago and just, and just kind of reading about these different guys mentality, like the championship mentality, what, what makes a champion yeah. and what makes the greatest versus what makes a good player. And just their attitude every day in everyday life. And that's, you know, one, one of my favorite books too. Just, just again, I'm, you know, different sport, you know, different personalities in that sport, but the mindset's the same. Yep. You got to go out and dominate. No matter what you're doing, you want to be able to dominate. I love it. There was a Tiger Woods documentary on HBO that just went live last night. If you have HBO. I do. Uh, I haven't seen it yet. I've heard about it though. I haven't seen it. So that, that's on my, that's on my checklist to do this, this, this winter. I fell asleep watching it, which shows how 9.15 is bedtime for me. So I, I was out after the Bears were – the Bears lost. It took all my energy with them, and I passed out early. But uh, yeah. last question for you, Coach. You um, obviously went to high school, uh, wrestled under the great Jeff Buxton, one of the greatest coaches of all time. What's something you, you picked up from Coach Buxton that you find yourself using now in your current role? I think just, you know, thinking outside the box – he was constantly challenging us to do, you know, he, you know, one of the funny stories I had was it was our graduation day at Blair and he had gotten these new weight vests. And so me, you know, me and my buddies were kind of, you know, it's the last day of school. So, you know, we're not really in class We're seniors. We're, we're walking around campus and you see his red, he had a red Toyota Highlander, which every time I still see one, I get nervous because I'm waiting for bucks to roll down the window and be like, come here. And uh, so we see him, we're kind of hanging out, playing, you know, football or something. We see him roll up, he rolls his window down, sticks his finger out, starts pointing us over. We walk over and he's like, I want you guys to wear these vests all day today. We're like, it's 90 degrees out. We're in dress clothes where, you know, we're getting ready to go to class. He's like, I don't care. You got to wear them. I want to see how comfortable they are, like running to class and walking, sitting down in class. So for six hours, we had this weight vest on. I mean, we sweated through our dress shirts and everything. And. (laughs) So it was just one of those things. He never knew what he was going to come up with. And he, you know, we'd be, you know, they, they were reconstructing one of the, the golf course and they had a giant mound of dirt. And he like, I see him looking at it. He's like, 
all right, so after practice, he put, he's like, put your running shoes on. And we're doing buddy carries up this giant mound of dirt that's, you know, all uneven. It's not meant to run on. It's just a giant construction pile of dirt. And so he was constantly challenging us to, you know, think outside the box. He had a giant buoy, a steel ball that we'd have to hand fight with. You try to run your partner over with it what? outside on the grass. Yeah, it was, I don't know how, it's probably like eight feet tall. It was a giant steel buoy. And, you know, you do like, you kind of push it down, but then every once in a while he'd be like, all right. You two fight. I mean, like pushing the ball, trying to trying to get the guy to back up. And there's yeah. just little things that, that that you see in everyday life that you'd never think of as as a workout. And he was so it was never just one thing we were doing. He was always innovating. You know, whether it was box jumps, you know, outdoor, you know, running. He had an outdoor rope that we'd have to climb and you know battle on the outdoor rope to see. You know, you'd be we had the horizontal rope in the room, mm -hmm. and after practice we'd have to do three horizontals. But the thing was, if you were slow, the guys behind you would just run you over. So you were constantly trying to like, catch, or you were, if you were behind someone, you were trying to catch them and knock them off the rope. And God, you know, animals in there, dude. Oh. It, got, it, got, it got savage in there. Jeez. He, he just kind of bred that mentality. But then as soon as you got off the mat, it was always his mind. He's like, what happens in the room stays in the room. Like, it doesn't matter if, if, you, if you hit a guy in the room, you know, you guys still got to eat dinner together. Yeah. And that's something I try to preach to our guys where you can't, you can't take this stuff personally in the room. You're there to push each other. And if, you know, if it takes getting a little physical with somebody, that's fine in the room. But once, once you're in the locker room, you can't, can't hold that grudge. You got to let it go. You know, that again, that that's a brother. Yeah. You know, everyone on the wrestling team's your brother and no matter what they do to you, you got to help them, help them get better. And, and that's, that's the biggest takeaway I got from it. Just building that family unity in the team. And like, it keeps it interesting too. I mean, he's not that stodgy old guy where it's the same thing every day. He's, you never know what's going to throw at you. So that's fun for the guys. Yeah. It's, Cause he's one of those guys where he, when he's serious, he's serious, but he's also going to make fun of you. He's also going to joke with you. You can also make fun of him. And just one more funny story about boxing. Please. Well, I got all day. It's, it's funny now. It wasn't funny at the time. It was right after uh, I was third or fourth hip surgery. And of course, knowing him, he's not taking any time off. He's in the wrestling room. Me and my buddy are wrestling and, you know, one of us double legs the other and we land on top of him and he lands just face down and we just hear him like grunting and like, ah, ah. And we're like, Oh God, we both slowly get up. Everyone in the room stops. We're looking and we're like, if we stay in here, we're in trouble. So me and my buddy just get up and we just book it out of the room. <laughs> Cause he's, and he said, he just sat there for like, we had dislocated his hip that he just had surgery on. Oh my God. And so he, he was sitting there trying to like hold it in. And we just like ran out. And like two days later, he comes up to us and he's like, That's the smartest thing you guys ever did was to get out of that room. And we're like, God. Oh, we know. We hid from him. He was like, We'd see his car and we'd like bolt the other way. We're like, Man, we don't want to. We're already on his dad's side. We don't want him catching up to us right now. Cause he lived and, on campus, right? Yeah, he lived right on campus. So and he knew everything that was going on, man. He, every rumor that was spread around that campus he knew he was smart he, he you know we have study hall there so he, you know teachers have to oversee study hall and he was always the study hall you know guy in a girls dorm so all the girls would tell him everything that's going on in the wrestling team and they thought it was you know they thought he was like oh so cute and so funny We're like you guys gotta quit ratting us out you guys are getting us in trouble here uh, but he's he's awesome he's you know one of the best things i have in my life is to, to go to blair and, and be able to wrestle under that guy he just, he just, he loves every guy that he's ever coached. And he's, you know, the biggest thing too, he would bring guys in from all over the country, you know, all, all over the state. Everyone was welcome in the Blair room. It, it didn't matter whether you were a competitor to us or not. He wanted everyone in there to wrestle. I've heard that. Like Mike Gray was in there too, right? Yeah. We trained a lot with Mike Gray. Zach Gray was in there all the time. His like whole junior and senior year, he'd be coming into practice. So it was, it was an open door policy there. And, and I think that's why the teams are so good. Yeah. We wrestled them, but we weren't hiding from anybody. Anyone who wanted to come in, they were more than welcome to come in. I'm going to hit you with one more since we're on coaches, because I got to ask, Sergey Glazov, one of the goats <laughs> in the room, same question, man. What, what have you picked up from that master over his uh, tenure there in, in Michigan? Oh, man, Ser Sergey's the best. He, he's, again, he's one of those guys, he's serious, but he's also one of the funniest guys I've ever met. I mean, he's always joking around and, he, he's, he's definitely a straightforward guy. He doesn't beat around the bush. If he thinks you're doing something wrong, he's going to tell you. And I think the biggest thing that, that I've learned from him is just, you got to continu continuously learn. He's, he's always showing us new things that he watched. He's constantly watching film and 
I mean, I don't know how many hours a night he spends watching, but every day, every day he comes in, he's telling me about some match he watched or sending me some match that he watched the night before. And it's, you know, guys that are wrestling now. And it's also guys that were wrestling when he was wrestling. So yeah. kind of, he's he kind of taught me that just because it worked in the sixties or seventies or eighties doesn't mean it doesn't work now, you know? So he, it, it's been awesome to pick his brain and I've, I've been lucky enough. I was in Belarus with him for three weeks last summer or two summers ago. And uh, just being able to hang out with him and, you know, tell him, like I was telling my parent, my dad, I was like, dude, I'm just like sitting down, hanging out with Sergey. Right. Like, talking Belarus, shock. Like, we're just, <laughs> yeah. We're talking wrestling. We're joking around with each other. I'm like, how lucky am I? You know, this is what I do for a living. This is my job. My God, dude. He, I heard his, uh, his parterre is just filthy. Oh yeah. When, when he came out for the first summer, when they were, you know, doing the, the camp around the country, him and his brother. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I, you know, I didn't know him at the time. I knew who he was, but he's like, he was showing me some gut wrench. I'm like, oh, cool. And he's like, yeah, get down, Kellen, get down, get down. I'm like, all right. He's like, so he's starting to show me. He's like, fight me. I'm like, all right, I fight him a little bit. I'm like, dude, this guy's like 62, 63 years old. Like, <laughs> I'm not going to go too hard on him. And he like, you know, I let him turn me and he like starts slapping. He's like, harder. So I start fighting him. You know, I'll give him, you know, 60, 70%. Turns me again. He's like, no, harder, 100%. So I'm like, all right, this old dude's not turning me. Like, I don't care how good he was back in the day. He's not turning me. And he starts, starts going hard, hard, hard. All of a sudden I feel his lock, like lock slip, which is normally a good thing. And then all of a sudden he squeezes me. I'm like, oh, it takes the whole breath out of my whole left side of my body goes numb. All my ribs like are like, numb, like a sharp pain and then numb. And he turns me and for like four days, I couldn't feel my ribs. I don't know what he did, but I was like, <laughs> all right, this guy's still got it. Oh my God. Yeah, he'll still jump in there and do some parterre every once in a while. And it's it's funny. These guys, these young guys think like, ah, he's not gonna turn me. And he he turns every one of them. Dude, I when I was in uh, my sophomore year of high school, I was at the uh Sunkiss Kids Camp at Arizona State, just five day normal camp. Randomly at the same time, the team USA women's camp was there and he was the head coach. And so I would hang out in between sessions and watch him. And I, that began my fascination with him. And I just I love Sergey Belaglazov. And actually that tour you're talking about. I caught up with him in Chicago and he was one of the first guys on this show. He's just awesome. Um, and his brother's super nice too. It's it, you guys just have like one of the best staffs maybe in the country there. It is coach boy. Is it Boyard or Boyland? Yeah. Boyard. 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 He used to be a head coach. I mean, it's like just the staff there. You got to be on your game when you're at the Michigan room. Yeah. I mean, we have, I think one of the best staffs. Dave's definitely the best volunteer coach in the country. I mean, the guy's super knowledgeable and, Obviously, you know, he knows how to run a program and he's super technical and, and our guys love him. We, you know, we're lucky to have him. And, uh, but yeah, Sean, Josh, Sergey, I mean, we just have, you mm. know, and we, we all get along, which is awesome. I mean, we're all, we all hang out outside the room. So it's one of those things we're constantly talking shop, but, but we're also, you know, friends. So, so it makes it real easy to come in every day. I love it, man. Well, coach, it's been an honor. Uh, I remember when I was a freshman at Fargo watching you and Ke- Jimmy Kennedy scrap, he was my hero. And I think you took him out and it broke my heart, but uh, man, it's been, it's been awesome to catch up with you. Best of luck to you guys this season, coach Russell. Yeah. Thank you.